Hi, my name is Jack Aiello, and I'm a 28-year survivor of multiple myeloma. I remember in 1995 when I was diagnosed, and the doctor told me I had two to three years to live, and there were only two treatment options available. I uh, remember going home to my wife, told her the little bit I understood about this disease, and suffice it to say, we shared a good cry. I had kids who were 16, 14, and 10 years old at the time, and I knew I was going to have to go into the hospital, and so I just told them that I was there was something wrong with my blood and I was going to have to have it treated. But I wondered, would I be seeing the kids graduate from high school? Who was going to teach my son to hit a curveball in Little League? who was going to pay for them going to college. It was a difficult time, and I thought the most important thing for me was to find a doctor who was experienced in treating myeloma. And since then, we've had 13 or 14 new drugs approved by the FDA and more combinations of these drugs. And even more are in clinical trials today. I really believe that for today's newly diagnosed patient, you can be more optimistic about your diagnosis than any time in history. While we don't have a cure, as I've said, we have treatments available to manage this disease and for you relapse refractory patients, you'll hear some great results from the recent ASH meeting that are so excited. In particular, many abstract presentations were on the topic of drugs and a category of drugs called bispecific antibodies. And in fact, that's the conversation we're about to have. Here to help us understand more are Drs. Ajay Chari and Dr. Sandy Wong. Dr. Ajay Chari is Director of Clinical Research at the Multiple Myeloma Program in Mount Sinai in New York. And Dr. Sandy Wong is a blood disease specialist at the University of California in San Francisco uh, with a special interest in myeloma. Let's kick off the conversation with what was the big buzz this year at ASH, bispecific antibodies. We've heard of monoclonal antibodies like daratumumab. Most recently, the FDA approved a bispecific antibody called teclistimab or tecveli. So what exactly is a bispecific? I think it's a really exciting time. Um, I, I'll start with my one of my favorite kind of stories about the development of immunologic treatments in all of humans is that in 1980s, the Nobel Prize was actually given for creating a standard antibody. And that was taken by fusing a myeloma cell actually with a spleen cell. And so every human antibody that we use, whether it's for COVID, autoimmune diseases, cancers, owes its legacy to myeloma. And, but the first naked antibody, uh, which is this Y-shaped structure, was not approved in myeloma until about 30 years after that Nobel Prize was given. So even though antibodies were helping everybody else. And so the first naked antibodies were daratumumab and elotuzumab. And those basically bind the, the two Y-shaped structure, the ends of the Y-shape bind to one target. And typically that's the myeloma cell or whatever cancer cell. What's different about bispecific antibodies, depending on what people are into, but it's either a handcuff or double-sided tape. So basically what it does is it takes one side of the Y binds to a T cell um, you, through a target known as CD3, and the other side can bind to a myeloma cell, and you can change that up based on the protein. So the one that's commercially available now that's called teclistimab binds CD3 on the T cells to BCMA or B-cell maturation antigen. So the difference between that and a monoclonal antibody is the monoclonal antibody doesn't have that second arm connecting to the T cell. Is, is that correct? 
That's correct. So uh, monoclonal antibodies, they activate the immune system in a different way. So for example, drugs like um, daratumumab uh, or isatuximab, for example, um, they they activate the immune system by essentially uh, uh, several ways. One is they act like almost like post-it notes, if you will, uh, where they flag uh, cells are not supposed to be there, i.e. the myeloma cells, mm -hmm. and that uh, leads to immune system to know, hey, this is not going to supposed to be there. Let's get rid of this myeloma cell. So that's like how that's how a monoclonal antibody uh, works. And uh, whereas the uh, bispecific T cell engagers, the way they work is they physically attach onto those T cells and like bring the T cells in physical proximity with the myeloma cells and the T cells. These are um, cells that get rid of. Um, uh, uh, myeloma cells that's not supposed to be there. So they they secrete their toxins, et cetera, and get rid of the myeloma cells. So they do work very differently. Remarkable how well these agents are working, but basically it's an off-the-shelf product. So that's important. A lot of people may have heard about CAR Ts that also target BCMA, but the difference is this is ready to go. It doesn't have to be manufactured for each patient. You don't need to go through stem cell, the T cell collection, manufacturing, and waiting. This is an off-the-shelf product that's the same for every patient with myeloma. And so then what the, the drugs do is basically traffic the T cells in our bodies to whatever you're trying to bring them to. So in this case, the T cells in a patient that are pre-existing are trafficked to wherever the myeloma is. And when the T cells are brought right up against the cancer, they recognize the cancer, they release certain chemicals or cytokines that poke holes in the cancer cell, and that leads to cell death. Um, so it's basically like I, I say that it's like bringing your army uh, straight to the enemy as opposed to kind of hoping and praying that they find the right place to go. The teclistamab that was just approved and other bispecifics, just to let the readers know, are so far for relapsed refractory patients. Those are patients who have gone through several lines of previous treatments before getting to these bispecifics. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. And just to put this whole space into context, you know, about say uh, five, six years ago, the way drugs get approved is that they're first tested in heavily treated patients, as you mentioned, relapsed refractory myeloma. And the benchmark to get a new drug approved was about 20 to 30% response rate um, lasting about three to four months. And so, and those numbers sound modest, but we have to keep in mind, those are in patients who had exhausted all available therapies. So, you know, when I started in myeloma 17 years ago, thalidomide was just coming on the scene. And so at that point, relapsed refractory was, okay, you had thalidomide and maybe a transplant. Now, you typically, we're talking about the big five drugs, lenalidomide or revlimid, pomalidomide or pomalist, bortezomib or velcade, carfilzomib or kyprolis, and a CD38 antibody such as daratumumab or sarclisa. And that is a very different patient than somebody who just had had thalidomide. So as we keep approving drugs, this what we call unmet need, which is patients who've exhausted their currently available therapies keeps changing. And in spite of that, what's remarkable about the entire what we call T-cell redirection, whether it's bispecific or CAR-Ts, you know, we're saying 70 to 100 is the new 20 to 30, because that's how many patients are responding to these drugs, even though these are much, much sicker patients and have had more treatments, more drugs, we're getting better responses. And that's what's really exciting. I literally have patients whom we had discussed hospice uh, a few years ago, and now they're in their deepest, longest remission they've had in years. And it's a, a mind-changing, game-changing era that we're in with uh, this immunotherapy treatment. For one who's been watching new treatments being developed, and now seeing 60 or 70% response rate just for an individual drug. It's pretty incredible. Dr. Chari, you presented on a different bispecific called Talquitamab, also from Janssen, the same manufacturer of Teclistamab. Can you share the results of this trial and, and what might make Talquitamab different from other bispecifics? First of all, this work, I just want to start with, it takes tremendous uh, team, starting with the patients and their caregivers, and then the entire study team, Janssen, the pharmaceutical, the FDA, and other regulatory agencies. So uh, with that, the phase one portion of the study where the we're looking to just find the safety and what's the um, right dose and schedule, 
the phase one study just got published in New England Journal uh, last week. And so that was very exciting. Um, and it was also a large phase one study with over 200 patients. Um, and those uh, efficacy and safety, uh, so how well it works in the safety profile were then validated in this phase two study. And that's what we presented at ASH. Um, and the phase two study had three major cohorts of patients. Um, and one got a dose of uh, we call 0.4 milligrams per kilogram subcutaneously every week. A second cohort got 0.8 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. And the third cohort could have gotten either one of those doses, but was a very important subgroup of patients who had already had prior TCO redirection therapy. So meaning patients who'd had other CAR-Ts and bispecifics, because even though these are 60 to 100% response rate, we're still seeing relapses. So you still need new agents. And so um, that was the goal of the study, to really look at these three subgroups. Um, and I would start with who these patients were. Uh, these were patients with heavily treated disease. About 60% were high risk in some way, which is a very high number. And that could be defined either by high risk, um, what we call genetics, uh, cytogenetics in fish, high risk because they had myeloma coming out of the marrow, what we call extramedullary disease, or high risk because they had so-called ISS stage three disease at the time of study entry. So in this population with a typical five to six lines of therapy over six to seven years, where almost 95% of patients were refractory to daratumumab, 75% were what we call triple class refractory, so proteasome inhibitor, inhibitor, IMID, and a CD38, and 95% of patients were progressing on their last therapy. So in this heavily, heavily treated group, as a single agent drug, this we saw 73 to 74% response rate in both of those schedules that we mentioned. Um, it, that response rate was maintained in high-risk patients and ISS3 patients and patients with regardless of lines of therapy, um, reg regardless of the number of drugs they were refractory. The one group that had slightly lower response rate was those with extramedullary disease. And even those had a 50% response rate, which I think is outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Chari. Dr. Wong, you presented on a bispecific called l from Bristol-Myers Squibb. Can you share the results of this trial and what might make l different from other bispecifics? Yeah, great, great question. So um, we presented both the updated uh, uh, follow-up on the intravenous l cohort, as well as the subcutaneous l cohort. And the uh, intravenous cohort was actually presented initially uh, in ASH of 2019. Um, so this is has there's been quite some time that's elapsed. And basically the take home message with the IV anuctamab was that even though uh, the response rates uh, uh, initially uh, looked uh, exciting, there were really, when we got to target doses of 10 milligrams, there were just um, a lot of um, CRS, high grade CRS, that stands for cytokine release syndrome. Um, uh, people got really sick from CRS and actually one person uh, died from it. So it was not really suboptimal in terms of the side effects. We don't want people to really obviously get sick um, from these treatments. Um, however, those patients that were dosed on the intravenous um, uh, on Dr. Mab, those people that responded, responded for a really long time. So we're really, really excited about that. Um, however, we had to pivot to the subcutaneous on Dr. Mab because of those safety concerns. And what we see with, uh, with the subcutaneous on Dr. Mab was at the overall, in terms of the overall response rate, um, it was actually uh, uh, awesome. It was really great. It was a 65%, which is very and much in line with other uh, T cell engagers. And then in terms of the safety, all the CRS events were very um, low grade. They were short lived. They were what we call grade one uh, to two. Um, and it, it was a safety, in terms of safety profile, it was a lot more manageable compared to the intravenous um, on the map. So that was the, what was really exciting um, about uh, our presentation that now not only is subcutaneous obviously more um, uh, convenient for patients, um, but the CRS events were uh, much more uh, easier to handle and the overall response rate uh, was 65%. How does this stand out uh, from the other T cell engagers? And so it's several things. Um, this is not the only subcutaneous um, uh, uh, BCMA directed T cell engager, um, but uh, th there are some that are intravenous. Um, for example, the uh, ABVV, 3A3, 
that is intravenous. Um, so this is great that this is subcutaneous. The other thing is that, you know, it's hard to compare apples to oranges because, you know, all these different uh, BCMA directed T cell engagers have different follow up uh, time frames. And for this one, the follow up is very, very short. It's only around four months on uh, the median. Um, but in terms of infectious uh, events, in terms of uh, opportunistic infections, we really haven't uh, seen much by ways of that uh, uh, for the for this particular um, uh, drug. So, you know, maybe that, you know, uh, eventually will pan out in, in longer follow-up studies, but unclear, right? Because follow-up is, is pretty short. Um, but what is really exciting is that the MRD negativity was 80%, despite these patients having been followed for that long. So that is actually really exciting. And so, so basically to answer your question is, you know, we don't have a, um, uh, a, a signal for these high-grade uh, infections though, or opportunistic infections, though, again, follow-up is, is pretty short with this drug. Speaking of infections, what are the common side effects we're seeing with bispecifics altogether? And I understand some research is unearthing data about how myeloma patients on certain drugs do with COVID and the vaccine. Yeah, um, I'll start with what's the most severe toxicity, and then we'll go to what's common because I think they're different and they're both equally important to address because from a patient perspective, if it's severe but rare, you may not be as concerned, but if it's common and frequent, that's a different, right? So starting with the most severe side effect is really the low blood counts. Um, and so we see that in about a third of patients with this drug, um, typically it happens in the first few cycles. And my personal hypothesis, I think what's happening is when the army's going to the marrow where, where a lot of myeloma lives, Yes, you kill the myeloma, but you may temporarily also affect the rest of the marrow. And then once the myeloma clears, you see that improve. So about a third of patients. Patients may hear that called cytopenia. Is that correct? Okay, that's exactly right. It could be the white cells, the red cells, or the platelets. Um, and so those are important. But this is already a little bit less than some of the other drugs, which can have as high as 60%. And so this is about half of that. The second huge thing which you alluded to, um, and it's very important, is the infection. Um, and I can tell you, being in New York City in the pandemic, this was really difficult situation. I mean, we had ex patients on experimental therapies, and we were facing these life-threatening COVID dis dis decisions every day. And so we didn't know what to do with this uh, setting. And so I think the infection profile of this talquetamab is very unique. And then I'll give you three ways of why I think it differs from some of the other products. First is the rates of severe infections uh, was about 10 to 15%, which is still, we want it to be zero. But to put that into context, some of the other drugs are 45%. And we're not just talking minor infections, which can be seen with uh, any myeloma patient because of the nature of the disease, but this is severe life-threatening infections, right? What we call grade three, four. And so that was relatively modest. Second. The COVID signal is very different with this agent. Um, both uh, the talquetamab as well as a lot of the other bispecifics are all accruing during the era of COVID. And yet in the phase one study that was published in New England Journal with about 250 patients, there were zero COVID-related deaths. And in this study, there were two COVID-related deaths despite 10% of the patients having COVID. Um, and so that's a unique signal. And in fact, in our laboratory at Mount Sinai, when we've tested people getting talquetamab, uh, their response to the COVID vaccine, they do very well. Um, they're able to generate antibodies, which we don't see with some of the other bispecifics because of the nature, I believe, of the target. And the third and final difference between this drug and the, some of the other bispecifics is the need for infection prevention treatments. What you alluded to, what, is there anything we can do to reduce infection? And there is IVIG, which is intravenous immunoglobulin, and that's an intravenous infusion given once a month to boost the good uh, IgG levels. And here, only about 10% of patients needed IVIG. And so all of those features of this drug are very unique. Um, some of the other products are having as high a rate of 40% of patients needing IVIG. And I think this bodes well because these are probably the two most important features, which is the cytopenias and blood count and infections in terms of how these drugs are used in the future. Because the ability to combine drugs depends on each agent's side effect profile. And because infections are quite common and because blood count issues are quite common, um, that can make some of these bispecifics difficult to combine. And I think that in contrast bodes well for talquetamab. Uh, 
But there are some issues with talquetamab that uh, are common, uh, but typically low grade. So one you've alluded to, which is cytokine release. I would say as a class, all the bispecifics create, have cytokine release syndrome on the order of 70% or so, typically low grade. Um, in contrast, some of the CAR-Ts have a little bit higher, more severe cytokine release. So what is cytokine release? It's when the army recognizes the cancer, the T cells, they release their chemicals, and those chemicals can cause symptoms such as fever, low blood pressure, low oxygen, uh, confusion, lethargy, seizures, and even in rare cases, death. With bispecifics, it's generally very low grade. Most of the patients are getting a fever. So there's a big focus on lowering the cytokine release syndrome with treatments like bispecifics. In particular, I saw one trial which looked at trying to reduce CRS by giving tosuluzumab ahead of time. And I've seen things like step-up dosing to reduce side effects. I know doctors have asked for possible pretreatments for reducing infections. Can you share more about this? Everybody would eventually would love to be able to use these drugs on an outpatient setting. Nobody wants to be admitted to the hospital, right? You know, for a week just to, you know, um, get started on these drugs. If we're able to do this safely as an outpatient, that would be really a big game changer for, I think, you know, patients and the quality of lives. Mm -hmm. But we have to keep in mind one of the very things that's gonna make bispecifics different than CAR-T, CAR-Ts are pretty much done at transplant centers, at specialized large academic centers. These are off the shelf products that we hope eventually can get to the community because we recognize that most myeloma patients are not being treated in the global setting at academic centers, they're being treated by community doctors. So if we wanna get these drugs out to the community, we have to make them as safe as possible. And so one strategy how do we reduce that 70% cytokine release? One is by giving this drug called tocilizumab. And so in one of the studies with a bispecific known as sevastimab, that rate of cytokine release dropped from say 70, 80% to about 30%. So that, that's very encouraging. And the other way to do that, which you mentioned is don't throw the whole army at the disease at once, like gradually increase the doses so that if there is some chemical release, it's, it's not all at once that creates a lot of drama you start with a low dose and then you gradually work your way up. So both strategies are being done. And with talquetamab, um, we didn't do preventative TOSI, so tosiluzumab, which is the anti, what we call IL-6 antibody, which blocks the fever. We were allowed to give it when patients had cytokine release, but we didn't give it preventatively, which is what was presented at ASH in that one study. And then the other side effects I would just mention for this drug are three things. And so one could ask, well, why is this one different than other drugs in terms of why was potentially the infection better? Why was the blood count issues perhaps not as bad? And we think it has to do with the target. The target is called GPRC5D, which is a mouthful, but basically it's a protein that is expressed on myeloma cells primarily. We think less so normal plasma cells and even less so in the normal, what we call hematopoietic compartment, which is the, the precursor cells that give rise to our blood counts. So perhaps the specificity of this protein is what underlies the favorable uh, blood count and cytopenia issues as well as the infection profile. But there are a few tissues that do express GPRC5D. Um, and fortunately, it's not the major organ. So we didn't see like heart, lung, liver, kidney, those organs were not affected. The main thing we did see is GPRC is expressed on heavily keratinized tissue. Keratin people may have heard of because it's in the skin, nails, hair, et cetera. We didn't see a lot of hair loss, but we did see some rashes in the early part of the treatment, which are typically managed with steroids, either oral or topical steroids. And then we did also see some uh, nail changes and finally taste changes. So we saw dryness, difficulty swallowing, change of the taste. And that I think is the most difficult to manage. We, we've tried artificial saliva and other things, uh, but I would start with, in spite of everything I told you, the one signal that you can look at to see what the tolerability of a drug is, how many people came off for non-progression, and this was 5%, which means that we were able to manage the side effects to keep people on the drug. I still think we need to do better, and we have to keep in mind that the side effect profile that a heavily treated population might accept is going to be different than the side effect profile of maybe somebody who's only had one line of therapy. But um, the good news is that these side effects, we do think are responsive to modulating the dose and intensity. So either dropping the dose or skipping a dose, uh, giving it less frequently, those seem to help. And I think that's why the rate of discontinuation was relatively low. And again, a huge shout out to the nurses because they're really 
on the front lines and helping patients deal with these side effects. And I'm, I never take my entire outstanding talent and nursing colleagues for granted. They're, they're really doing an amazing job. But those are basically, I think, the main side effects um, to cover with talcotamaz as well as most bispecifics, I would say. So let's just summarize the side effect profiles for these bispecifics. I would stay on bispecifics typically until they stop working. I take them every two or three weeks, depending on how they are dosed. Although I know there are some clinical trials looking at giving bispecifics for a fixed duration. Do these side effects change? Are they worse at the beginning? Whatever side effects I get at the beginning, do they continue as I'm taking the drug? There's three major bispecific targets that are being explored. We've talked about GPRC5D with talquetamab, but there's actually a second company also pursuing that that was also presented at ASH from Roche uh, targeting GPRC5D. The BCMA is a very busy space. Um, I think it's like the statins of myeloma, right? Like a uh, Crest or Lipitor. It's like, I, but it's great for patients because more competition means more choice, better cost profile. I think it's great for the market. But um, I would say the BCMAs seem to keep having a rate of infection that we don't see a plateau in. That's what's concerning to a lot of us is how do we find the right dose, schedule, and duration? Because it's one thing to have an infection in somebody whose myeloma is uncontrolled, because that we've seen before, that um, myeloma patients whose myeloma is uncontrolled will get infections because that's part of the cancer. Um, and what can be sometimes difficult to tease apart in these single-arm studies is you can't isolate out what's coming from the patients, like if the patient is a very sick patient, what's coming from the disease of the myeloma itself, and what's coming from the treatment, because you don't have a control arm to, in which to compare it to. Um, and so, but one of the things is, as your question uh, astutely asked is, is there any change? And with the infections, we're not seeing that level off with the BCMA. With talquetamab, we're not seeing it as much. And I would say with the sevastamab is probably somewhere in between. That's targeting another protein called FCRH5. So I would say infections, we haven't found the right magic uh, sauce yet, perhaps IVIG, but one other interesting paper that I think speaks to this topic is the same company, um, Genentech slash Roche, that did the prophylactic or preventative TOSI also happens to have the only bispecific that is a fixed duration. So they don't treat to progression, they treat for about a year. And what we saw is there's a small number, but about 17 patients that had come off the therapy and were in longer follow-up on that study. And what we know so far is of the patients that had a deep remission, they've been doing pretty well off therapy, which again is amazing for patients to have a treatment-free interval. Um, with talquetamab, because we're not seeing that relentless increase in infection and to the opposite, the side effects like the skin, nails, um, and the uh, taste get actually seem to get better with time there may not be as much of a need to do the fixed duration there. Maybe it's once a month dosing or something. And so we're pursuing all of these different strategies. But I would say that we got to look at everything. We got to look at the dose. We have to look at the frequency. We have to look at the duration of treatment and figure out for a given patient with based on a given target and based on their response. Um, because that Sevastamab data, which discontinued, for those patients that were not in a complete response, they did have earlier relapse. So I think you, it's, you can't have a blanket statement. I think you just got to look at each patient as an individual. Uh, but it's nice to have these options that are giving such outstanding responses. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot about biophysics. I can tell you there's also a lot of work still to do to understand the dosing, to understand if there will be prophylactics that go along with them to minimize those side effects, to see a fixed duration or use till progression will be the right treatment or just to reduce the dosing going forward. I still go back to what you said earlier that we're seeing response rates so high for just this drug, not even combined with something else. And for patients that have already gone through lots of prior treatment lines, it's certainly an exciting field. Just to add to that, not only are we seeing these responses, the median time to response is one month, and the median time to best response is two months. I mentioned those points because it gives us as physicians a lot more comfort in backing off on the dose and schedule, right? Because you're seeing the response early and it's deep. So if somebody has side effects, you're not as worried about backing off, right? And that's what's really nice about these drugs. Even if somebody does have side effects, it's very gratifying to them to have this myeloma that was shooting off and suddenly it's 
completely flattened out. And then people are willing to, so that's why I think the side effect profile, we got to do more work on. Um, and to that point, you know, in case people are listening, what are the next steps? So all of these phase one studies require confirmatory, all the phase one and phase two single arm studies have confirmatory randomized studies where the drugs being combined with different backbone agents. And also um, talquinumab in particular, because of the unique side effect profile, is also being combined with all the standard myeloma drugs in single arm studies, as well as with the other bispecific, which is really cool, right? Completely chemo speed free teclistimab with talquinumab is being studied. And lastly, we're trying to also improve the T cell function because we think perhaps one of the reasons the drugs may peter out is because of T cell health. And so there's approaches using things like checkpoint inhibitors, which boost your T cell function in combination with these agents. Doctors, as we wrap up this discussion on the latest in myeloma, specifically biospecifics, what are your thoughts on where we are in myeloma treatment and research? What's your message to myeloma patients and families in 2023? The the biospecifics are here and and it's really it's a dawn of a really a new era uh, because finally we have a off the shelf, off the shelf drug, which means that you can just take it, you know, right off the shelf and just give it to a patient. And it, for an off-the-shelf drug to have a response rate of 60 to 70%, that is absolutely amazing, right? You know, previous to this, um, DARA was our darling drug, right? Because the DARA, you know, and uh, and and we use it so so commonly nowadays in the frontline setting, in the relapse setting. And I, I and you're absolutely right, Jack. When when DARA was was FDA approved, the single agent by itself response rate in patients who are Relapse refractory um, was only around 30%, right? Now we're hitting like 60 to 70%. So this is extraordinary. And, and it's not just one drug, you know, we have multiple drugs against multiple targets that are showing such an impressive response rate. So I think it's really good news, this Ash. I'm really excited um, that, the, you know, to see all that amazing data being presented. So I think it's a really exciting future. We're just on the beginning. And of course, in less heavily treated patients um, is also a big area of investigation in addition to combination. So stay tuned for all of those exciting new studies to result out hopefully soon at a theater near you, right? By specifics, they're gonna be a fabulous treatment for option for myeloma patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Ajay Chari and Dr. Sandy Wong for your presentations and helping us better understand by specifics and sharing and being part of this conversation. Absolutely, anytime. Thank you so much. My pleasure to be with you and uh, best of wishes to everyone. I hope you took away something helpful and hopeful from this conversation. I'm excited to see what comes along next in myeloma. With the patient story, I'm Jack Aiello and I look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>